a blessing that sends you after us in these times, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, you guys, be seated if you, uh, there you go. My goodness, praise the Lord. Praise team, what a wonderful word from the Lord. Good night, guys. That's just amazing what God says to us. And uh, the term reckless is just, I think, a good term. I know most of us don't think about the Lord being reckless because we think of reckless as being something that is not of uh, good wisdom and good value. But when you think about the things the Lord says to us about the way he pursues us, like the parable of the lost sheep where he leaves the 99 and goes after the one, that just doesn't make good sense. What kind of shepherd leaves 99 to go after one, not knowing that when he comes back, the 99 will be there. Um, you know, the word reckless is a, good, is a good word to say how valuable we are to him and how nothing is more important than your soul to the Lord. And that he'll do whatever's necessary to present himself to you so that you can have an opportunity to receive him and to confront him and to be confronted by him and in the challenge of your soul. And the book of Revelation is a good book to, be, to begin to look at to see these kind of issues in life because it is such a profound presentation of, of, of God and, and, and the glorious love of God and the conclusion of what goes on in the lives of all of us as believers because it's a, a book that just challenges everything about um, our concepts of Christ and his church and what happens to us as, as the Lord begins to bring this old world and this universe to its natural conclusion because it does. Look at your neighbor and say, it will be over one day. God is in a progression. I mean, the time is progressing. And there's one thing about time, and I know you've noticed this because you've lived long enough to see this, that uh, time progresses whether you want it to or not. I mean, how many of you have said, man, I need a few more minutes? Well, do a few more minutes ever wait for you? No, they just keep ticking, right? So no matter how much we plead for more time or how much we, you know, we beckon the Lord, give me more time, I need to finish this project and blah, blah, time is an ordered thing that just keeps moving no matter whether you want it to or not, and you have to adjust to time, well... In the order of the universe, according to the book of Revelation, there is a time appointed in which all of these things will begin to conclude themselves, and, and time as we know it uh, is marching toward a countdown that has been ushered by the Holy Spirit of God in which um, all of these tremendous events that are described in the book of Revelation happen in order. Uh, on a progressive time, on a time schedule, and I'll just remind you that the clock is ticking. Let's say to your neighbor, the, oh, it, it's, it's ticking. The time is ticking, and though none of us know when, when, it, when it is going to be, uh, the Lord says that there is going to be a time where it will be, and the angels don't know the time, and Jesus said he didn't know the time. At least he didn't know the time while he was here on earth. Uh, because God hadn't shared with him while he was here in the midst of dying for us and going to a cross, I, I firmly am convinced that he knows the time now, uh, you know, that he is in heaven and he is awaiting his return. Uh, but the point being, we don't know the time. The angels don't know the time. No one knows the time. No one knows the day or the hour, but my Father which is in heaven only. And the book of Revelation is intended not to tell us, here's the time, but it's just to prepare us for those things that will come and those things which have been seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter so that we can see. Now, I want to remind you of, uh, of those four or five things up at the start of your outline. I've just wrote your notes down for you, those five things that are at the top, and just remind you one more time that we're not going to have a lot of time to do like rehearsals back 
on what we looked at the week before, but since we really just got started and then we had to miss a week, let me just kind of put you back where we were and we'll just read the passages and, and I wrote them in your notes so you can kind of see. All right, uh, the first thing that we see in verse one is the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant. So what is this book about? This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a book that is revealing Jesus and all of his glory. The book is not about John. It's not about the Holy Spirit. It's not about uh, the acts of the apostles. It's not revealing um, the disciples and the work of the people of God. This book, according to the first verse, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what is the book going to do? The book is going to reveal Jesus to us. That's what he's going to do. What Jesus is doing in the last days, what Jesus is doing while this earth is coming to an end of itself. Everything about the book of Revelation is intended to not be a chronicle of end times, but according to the first verse, this book is an apocalypsis, which is a Greek word from which we get the word, if you've ever heard, an apocalypse, which just means an unveiling. The book is intended to take the cover off. The cover off of what? The cover off of whatever has been covering our vision of Jesus. And it is to open up, the word apocalypsis means to unveil something which was previously hidden. So there have been some things that have been hidden from us. There are some things in the book of Daniel that God told the angels, seal these things up because this is not for the time right now. In other words, God says, there are some things I don't want the people now to know about because it's not for them. It's not going to be for them, so they don't need to know about it. But everything, according to the book of Revelation, that has been sealed up before, whereas for Daniel's age, certain things were not to be seen, everything is to be seen by us. God intends for us to see everything. So the book is about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Jesus who lost his glory on the cross of Calvary. Jesus who lost his glory, slain from the foundation of the world, now receives his glory back in the book of Revelation. Every bit of it, all of the symbols, all of the pictures, all of the events, everything that happens in the book has one purpose according to the first verse. It is to reveal Jesus Christ to you. So in this book, it is not, you know, cranky or those who see it or wild or those who see it or fanatical or those who see it. The book says that we are blessed if we see it and it's going to reveal Jesus Christ. And the writer is, is John. Let me just, and, and he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness of the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So the writer of the book is identified in the book as John. Who is John? Well, John is that beloved apostle, the only one who's still left alive around, around 100 AD. You know, the only one that he's probably 80 or 90 years old. Uh, which basically gives you a tremendous testimony. Here's an 80 or 90 year old man that the Roman government is still so frightened of yeah, yeah. that they feel like here's this old guy walking around the streets preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and he's having such an impact in the Roman world that they're fearful of this old man and they have to p banish him to some prison island somewhere so that he can't carry his message anymore. But the mistake they make is the mistake that all the world makes, and that is the power of the Word of God is not in the messenger, but it's in the message itself. Yeah. So the greatest testimony that you and I have is not that we're wonderful people or that we're something special, but that the message we carry is something special. Yeah. The power of God is in the Word of God and what the Word of God says. And so we are simply messengers. And John said, all right, I'm telling you, God spoke to me, and I'm John. Uh, this is a, an unusual thing because John also wrote the Gospel of John. John also wrote the letters in your Bible, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And this is the same John. Now, one thing you notice in the book of Revelation that you never saw in the Gospel of John is John, John names himself. 
If, you're, if you've studied the gospel of John, one thing that no doubt somebody said to you as a teacher is that throughout the whole gospel of John, John never identifies himself. John never says in the gospel of John, I, John, wrote this to you. He doesn't ever mention his name in the gospel of John. He just identifies himself as the one whom Jesus loved. He just calls himself, I, I, I am the one who Jesus loved, which I know to many of us might be some sign of arrogance, uh, so to speak. You know, well, I'm the one who Jesus loved the most and blah, 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 blah. But I think it's John's way of being humble, actually. I think it's John's way of saying, it's not about me. Uh, it's not important that you know me. I'm not the center of this. I, I just want you to know that I'm responsible because Jesus loved me and I love him. This was the John who laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper when Jesus said, one of you sitting at the table is going to betray me. Now, to show you how humble and how searching John was, and how much he relied on the confidence of the knowledge of Jesus and not himself. Just think about this. Here is John, and here are all the other disciples sitting at the Last Supper, after the Last Supper, and, you know, Jesus got the cup out, and he got the bread out, and he was having communion with them, and he just looks at all of them, and he says, I'm telling you that the person who's going to betray me is sitting at this table with us right now. And all of the apostles begin to look around at each other as if to say, well, I wonder which one it's going to be, you know. And they all kind of began to look suspiciously at each other. And John was so sensitive to the Spirit of God and trusted the Spirit of God so deeply and not his own spirit. He looked at Jesus and he said, he put his head on Jesus' breast and he looked at Jesus and he said, Master, is it I? In other words, Jesus, you know me better than I know myself. I don't think it would be me, but you know, you tell me, is it me? I mean, that's a sensitive spirit to God and to the word and to the wisdom of God. And that, I just remind you that this is the same John. It's the, he's the only disciple that's still alive, by the way. All of the other, Peter's been gone for, for, for six years or so. Paul has been gone. Uh, all of the other disciples, all of the other disciples, according to things like Fox's Book of Martyrs and other historical records, all of the other disciples have been martyred for the Lord. They've, they've died in terrible ways. They've been boiled in oil. They've been sawn asunder. They've been fed to the lions. They've been crucified upside down. Many of them would not receive the cross like Jesus received the cross because they thought it to be a blasphemous thing to be, to be hanged on a cross like Jesus was. So they made them turn them upside down and hang them on a cross in order to honor and not, and not insult the death of Jesus on the cross. This is the way these guys died. And I know lots of people say, I mean, was Jesus really real? Did, did the people that followed Jesus really believe that he was real? To which I would say, well, look at what happened to them. What happened after Jesus resurrected from the grave? What, before the grave, they ran for their life like school kids running from the school bully. They were nowhere around the cross. They headed for the hills. They got out of there, buddy. They beat feet and, and were gone. But after Jesus resurrected, what happened to these guys? Look at the revelation that happened. Look at, look at the change that happened. When, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, these guys became bold as lions. Jesus stood, I mean, Peter stood on the porch there in Jerusalem and began to preach to thousands of people that, the, that what they were jabbering about had nothing to do with anything but the fact that the Jews killed Jesus and you're guilty and you crucified him on the cross and God holds you responsible and 3,000 people People gave their heart to the Lord right there on the spot on that one day. Man, these guys became bold as lions. These guys became transformed and changed. And I just submit to you that though somebody might die for a lie, they won't die for something they know is a lie. Though you may be deceived and you may die for something that you think is one way, that it's not that way, but I submit to you that you would not die for something that you knew was a lie. As soon as they put that boiling oil down there, you say, oh, wait a minute, guys, this was just a big joke. I mean, you know, really, this is just a sham. I'm just, you know, I just said, I guarantee you, you would not allow yourself to be torn asunder by a lion or put in a boiling pot of hot oil. 
One of the reasons why John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, according to some of the historical writers, Tertullian and people like that, uh, reported that one of the reasons why John, that 80 or 90-year-old saint of God, had to be placed on the Isle of Patmos, which was a prison island, a rock in the middle of the Aegean Sea about 35 miles off of Sicily, it, it was a rock. That's all it was. I mean, it, it, it was an island that would make Alcatraz look like a Holiday Inn. I mean, it was, you know, it was just rocky, craggy. It had mines, and they made these guys work in the mines. And, I mean, it was a horrible place to be. No trees, no vegetation. I mean, it was a prison island. And they took that 80- or 90-year-old man and put him out there because they had, according to these historians, uh, truly wrote this, that he actually was boiled in a pot of hot oil. That they put him in the Colosseum and they and they boil, they put a pot of boiling oil and they put the old man in there and the old man didn't die. They couldn't kill the old man. And so that's when they decided, well, if we can't kill him, we got to get rid of him. And they took him and put him on the Isle of Patmos out in the, you know, out in the Aegean Sea so nobody would ever see him anymore. And I'm just saying that according to his own testimony, John says, I'm going to tell you, it was me who saw all this stuff because you need to know that I saw this with my own eyes and I'm giving a testimony of what I actually saw and so I'm a witness and I'm here to testify. In the Gospel of John, he just said, I'm the one whom Jesus loved, but here he's acting as a witness to say, look, I saw this. I'm telling you this is the truth. I'm telling you that God revealed it to me and, and so I'm standing for this and I'm telling you who I am. So the writer is John. The revelation is about Jesus Christ. It's not revealing end time things. It's not revealing what's going to happen. It's revealing Jesus Christ and what Jesus is going to be doing at the end of the age. How Jesus is going to be the judge. How Jesus is going to have his glory refilled. How Jesus is going to come. What kind of person is he going to be? What is going to be his purpose? How are things going to wind down? And what is Jesus doing in regard? And how is all all of this stuff that's happening, how is it going to reveal a greater revelation of Jesus Christ? So if you ask me, okay, what would be the purpose of studying the book of Revelation like we're doing now, Pastor? I mean, what would be your purpose? What would you like to see happen? Well, here's what I would like to see. I hope that every message that I share with you out of the book of Revelation does one thing. It reveals Jesus to you in a deeper way. That's what I want. I mean, I'm not about all the mysteries and all the philosophies and all the everything else. Oh, we'll look at a lot of that stuff. But what you really need to see more than anything is, what does this say about the glory of Jesus Christ? How does, how does this show us Jesus in a deeper way? How does this lead us to a respect for Jesus in a deeper way? So the book is about Jesus. The, the writer's John, the reader, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Basically, the book just says, if you want to be blessed, how many of you in here want to be blessed? Is there anybody here that doesn't want to be blessed? All right, come on to the altar, you liar. You got, you got the spirit of deceit on you. Come on right down here. You know, either you're loony, loony or, you're, or you're deceitful. I mean, we all want to be blessed, right? Well, the Bible, I mean, here's the book of Revelation said, if you want to be blessed, let me tell you how to be blessed. Read this book. You know, this is to me one of the most neglected books in the Bible. Even though everybody knows the name of the book, how many have read the book? Many people know that the book of Revelation is about end time things and then they, they know it's in their Bible, but how many turn to the last book of the Bible? The other 65 books of the Bible, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The other 65 books in the Bible, Jesus is the precious Lamb of God that gave his life for everybody. He's the wonderful Savior. He's the Messiah. You know, he's, he's the giver of his life. In the book of Revelation, he's the king. In the book of Revelation, he comes back in judgment. He comes back uh, on, a, on a white horse with irons of fire and a rod of iron, and he rules and he judges the nations. But how many are... are I mean, even though we may know that, we stay away from the book. I'm just telling you, I'm just saying to you that we have an enemy of our soul who tries in every way to hinder us from being blessed in life. And one of the ways that we lose the blessing or miss the blessing is we don't read this book. Jesus said, if you want to be blessed, read the book. And not only read the book, but hear the words of the prophecies of the book. And then be prepared to do 
what you hear in the book. And not only does the book begin in verse 3 with a blessing, it ends with a blessing also. It's the only book in the Bible. Though all of the books in the Bible are blessed books. Don't get me wrong. All, every book in the Bible is a blessed, wonderful book. This is the only book in the Bible that begins with a blessing and ends with a blessing. About six or eight verses from the end, it says, Hey, just want to remind you one more time, blessed is he who reads the words of these prophecies. Well, right now, I'm the one reading them off of the screen, you know, so I'm going to be blessed. I say, Lord, I want my blessing. I'm reading them, all right? But you want to be blessed, you read the words. Not just hear them, but read them yourself. Open your Bible up. Get in a book. Read those things. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Read them personally. And then hear what God has to say. Come and be trained, taught, looked at. How it is. How does this prophecy show Jesus? What is it all about? And then the main thing is we have to be prepared to do. Are you prepared to do the things? that you might do in response to what God is telling you in the book. It says, if you are, you'll be blessed. So, you know, the revelation is Jesus, the writer's John, the recipients, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the readers are blessed, and then the recipients, and now he says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, I've written in the last note on the back of page, or the last note on page two, and I won't get into it deeply because this guy's kind of one of those little things that you can kind of dig a ditch and get in. But, but you will hear this over and over, and you'll see this over and over. There are, in the Bible, in, in the book of Revelation especially, and you, you guys, any of you have ever heard any teaching on the book of Revelation, you realize that numbers in the book of Revelation are very important because there, certain numbers are used over and over and over again. And you can't help but see these numbers because they, they just pop up in some various places that seem to be significant. And here's one that says there are seven churches that receive this letter. So John sees some things, and the Spirit says, all right, write these things down and send these things to these seven churches. And then it names the seven churches. And the churches, well, you'll see them in just a second, but the churches are actually churches that are real live churches, just like Freedom River Church. Church. There are people that meet in that church, and it is a church that every Sabbath has meetings and it has teach. It's just a real, live, active church in Asia Minor. And I know that sound Asia Minor. I know that's another one of those historical thoughts and terms. And when you hear that, you think Asia Minor. Oh my goodness! Then you're thrown into history, and then most of you don't care about history or flunk out of history or whatever you did with geography and history. I mean, it's, sometimes it might be hard to find a map of the United States, much less Asia Minor. You think, oh, my goodness, where is that? Well, if you look at a map today, Turkey, the nation of Turkey, about half of Turkey, the western half, the whole half that's around the Aegean Sea, that little half of Turkey, which is about the size of Texas, to give you an idea, that is Asia Minor. Every, that, that's, where, that's what Asia Minor is, about the size of Texas, right over there in the country of what is now Turkey, the western side, the side with the beaches and all of that kind of stuff, like California and so forth. I mean, it has beaches and so forth. And, and anyway, these churches exist like on city streets and little country villages there. And if you look at them, and I'll put a map up in just a second so you can kind of just get a little bit of an idea. If you start with the first one, which is Ephesus, and then you go to Pergamos and Thyatira, they, they form somewhat of a loose circle, actually, when you look at them in consecutive order like this, and they go around just like that. So he's writing a letter, a physical letter, to these seven churches. But, of course, the number seven has a meaning in itself. You say, what does the number seven mean? The number seven means complete. It means perfect perfect. God created the earth in six days. On the seventh day, when it was complete, he rested. Everywhere in the Bible you see the number seven, it always means the same thing. Let me just tell you this about scriptural numerics. One out of every 35 verse, excuse me, one out of every five verses in the Bible contains a number. That just means that the Word of God, 30, 31,175 verses in the Bible, one out of every five contains a number. If we believe the Word of God is inspired by the Spirit of God, that God dictated the Word of God to holy men of old, and they wrote down what the Spirit said to them to write, and and one out of every five verses has a number, we have to believe, just like every word is inspired, every number is inspired. 
I'm just telling you that God just didn't walk around picking numbers out of the air and go, well, let's just say there's 12 of these and there's seven of that and there's five of those and there's three of them. And you know, I'm, that They all have a purpose. And if they mean something in, in, in Revelation, they mean the same thing in Genesis. If they say it in Isaiah, it means the same thing as it does in Daniel or Revelation. And the number seven is the number that shows completion. It's the number that shows fulfillment. It shows perfection. So these letters to the seven churches is not only are written to seven real churches and real bodies of believer like us, but it also shows a complete picture of the church. It shows a, a, a complete uh, numbering of the church and a complete message to the church. And we, we'll get into all of that more often, but I just want you to know that it was addressed to seven churches that really existed. And, and what does he say? Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before the throne. So let's look at the resource. I mean, I know that sounds real preachery, you know, the reader, the writer, the resource, the recipients, and blah, 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 blah. But that's, I'm sorry, that's just the way preachers think. So, but, but you get the point. All right, who receives this and who, who speaks this? All right, the recipients are the seven churches. The recipients are everybody that's going to read it in the future. The recipients are those who are going to be blessed to hear what God says to reveal Jesus Christ. All right, who said all of this? I mean, is this John? Is this some psychedelic trip John goes on on the Isle of Patmos? I mean, is John chewing mushrooms or smoking weed? Or I mean, is this some kind of a is this some kind of a freaky psychedelic trip that John is on? Well, not according to what he says. He says, "Look, I'm going to tell you who gave this vision to me, and here's who gave me this vision: John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. All right, from who? From him who is." and who was, and who is to come. All right, let's stop right there. You remember what Jesus, you remember when, when, when the Lord spoke to Moses and said, go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go? You remember this? You remember the burning bush? And he said, take your shoes off or you stand on holy ground. And he says, I've been hearing the people cry down in Egypt because of their taskmasters, and I'm going to send you to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses looked at, at, at the Spirit of God in the burning bush and said, well, Lord, they're not going to believe me. When I tell them that I'm supposed to come down here and, and say, let my people go, the first thing I'm going to ask is, who says so? So who am I to say sent me? And God said, you tell them I am sent you. You tell them, not I was and I used to be and I will be and I might be, but you tell them that I am the one who am. I is and I will be and I is forever. And so who is this that gave him the first word? The one who is? Oh, the great I am. The one who was? Yeah, he not only was, he am. And the one who will be, he not only will be, he am. So who is talking to John? First of all, John says, it's the Father that's talking. It's the great I Am that's talking to me. And then he says, and from the seven spirits that are before the throne. Now you may be thinking in your mind, who in the world are these seven spirits that are before the throne? You mean there are seven Holy Spirits? Well, the answer is no. They're not seven Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. So what would these seven spirits be? Well, let me just mention to this that one of the things you have to do when you're trying to, to, to interpret the Bible is there are several characteristics that you use, and I'll probably mention some of these throughout as we go throughout here because I want you to know how to interpret things for yourself. I want you to see how it's done. Well, one of, you know, one of the things that you, that you, one of the tools that you use to interpret what something as mystical as this I mean, if you just look at this one verse and you say, this is from God the Father, this is from the great I Am, and from these seven spirits that are around the throne, then you might have to start wondering, who are these seven spirits? And then you'd have to start trying to make up, well, I wonder who they could be. Is there seven Holy Spirits? Or what kind of spirits are these? And then you'd just be all out there in the twilight zone, and you'd draw maps, you know, and you'd get on drugs, and you'd try to find, who in the world could these seven spirits be that are around the throne? Well, this is where you have to let the Bible help you translate the Bible. It's a principle of interpretation called synthesis. Everybody say synthesis. 
Now, it's not important that you remember the word synthesis, just the concept of it. The concept is that every time something is mentioned in the Bible, if you want to understand what it means, find out if it's ever been mentioned in the Bible before. If it's been mentioned in the Bible before, you go back and see where it was mentioned, see what it meant there, and then it'll help you interpret what it means here. This is why sometimes, you know, as I come to you and we're going verse by verse through James or whatever book it is, I'll tell you something about some, something that looks a little, okay, I don't understand what that means. And then I'll say, well, here's what it means. And you'll say, well, how do you know that? Well, it's because I know the Bible mentioned it like about five verses ago. And so I'm going to go back to the closest reference and I'm going to see what it meant there. And it'll help me understand what it means here. And many times in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation helps you understand and interpret the book of Revelation. And then other times, there are other books in the Bible, like the book of Isaiah and the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zechariah. I mean, Genesis, all of these books contain references that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. So if you want to find out what it means in Revelation, go back and see what it meant in Isaiah. Go back what it, what it said in Ezekiel or Daniel or Zechariah or any of the Word of God, because when God says something, it always means the same thing every time he says it. And so what are these seven spirits? Well, I'm going to take you back to the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is a prophet of God. Remember, what is a prophet of God? A prophet is someone who speaks from God to the people, right? A prophet is someone who speaks from God to the people. What is a priest? The priest is someone who speaks to the people from God. So Jesus is a prophet, priest, and a king. Just kind of keep that in mind. He's the perfect God-man. He reveals God to us and us to God. I mean, he is the great God-man. So what does the prophet Isaiah, the prophet who is saying, here's what God says to the people. Here's what God wants you to know. And, he, and in chapter 11, the book of Isaiah is full of prophecy, by the way. He is a prophet. You know that, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, these are all major prophets. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet who wrote Lamentations also. I mean, these are all prophets that spoke for God to the people. And look at what Isaiah said about a future one who would come. Let's see if you know who he's talking about. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. What's he talking about? He's talking about somebody that's being born out of the lineage of Jesse. Who is Jesse? You remember Jesse had seven, had eight sons, and uh, Samuel came in to anoint one that was going to be the future king of Israel, and he had all of his boys in there, and there was one who was so completely um, uh, uh, unimpressive that he didn't even call him in. He just let him stay out there with the sheep and play his little harp and dance before the sheep. He was a little shepherd boy. You remember his name? What was his name? His name was David. And you remember how God didn't touch the old man's heart about any of the other sons. And, and Samuel looks at Jesse and says, do you have any more sons? And he says, yeah, I got a dingbat out there. My little boy, he said... You know, he, he, he reminds, I mean, he just kind of had walks to the beat of his own drummer. And I mean, it couldn't be him. I know it couldn't be him. And so, Je and so Samuel says, well, you go out there and bring him in. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to all stand up. We're going to stand here. We're not even going to sit down. We're going to stand here until you get him back in here. And whenever, and when that little musical dingbat that was with the sheep walked in, he was so young. He was just a child. And all of a sudden, God touched the heart of that old man. And the old man, Samuel, the old prophet of God took the anointing oil of God and anointed David to be king of Israel while he was still a kid. That is the stem of Jesse. There were 12 generations from when the Babylonians captured, were cap from David until the Babylonians captured. Then there were 14 other generations from the time that Babylon was captured until the coming of Christ. Jesus is from the lineage of David. He is from the root of David. So what is this talking about? This is talking about the future Messiah that is going to come. This is the one who's going to save the world from his sin. And where is he coming? He's a stem from Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Clearly talking about Jesus. Notice what it says about the description of the character of this stem of Jesse. What does it say? And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And you see I put number one. You remember Revelation says seven spirits. All right, look, here's spirit number one. The spirit of the Lord is what's in him. So there's the first spirit that's in Jesus. 
shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom. All right, there's the second of the seven spirits. So he has the spirit of the Lord in him. He has the spirit of wisdom in him. And, and, the, and of understanding becomes number three. And the spirit of understanding is going to be in him. And the spirit of counsel is the fourth spirit that inherits the character of Jesus. And the and of power. So the spirit of power becomes the fifth spirit that has housed within Jesus and the spirit of knowledge, which is the sixth spirit that is housed in the character of Jesus and of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord becomes the seventh spirit. So when John says, I'm keep bringing a message from the one who am and I'm bringing a message from the spirit, the seven spirits that inhabit the character and the nature of Jesus. So this is the spirit of fear, the spirit of wisdom of the Lord, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of fear of the Lord. All right, there are your seven spirits right there. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's talking about the Holy Spirit that fills Christ, the Holy Spirit that is the nature of Christ manifesting itself in seven categories. I know some of you may say, well, are you sure that's what that means? Well, let me, let me just lay something else beside it. In the book of Galatians, you're familiar with Galatians chapter 5. I know you all are, and you'll recognize this passage when I quote it. In, 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 in Galatians 5, uh, uh, the Bible says, and the fruit of the Spirit is... And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, meekness, and temperance. All right, so... Notice that the Bible doesn't say the, the fruits are as that plural, right? I mean, when it says the fruit of the Spirit is, mm -hmm. all right, is is a singular verb. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about a single thing, you say this is. If you're talking about multiple things, these are. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is, mm -hmm. and then it lists nine things Love, fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and self-control. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit, though it is a singular fruit. Everybody say, you just have one Spirit, but that Spirit manifests itself in nine flavors. I mean, think of this that there is a single tree of the fruit of the Spirit, but it has nine different flavors of fruit on it that, sh that, that represent the completeness of what the fruit of the Spirit is. In other words, you don't get to choose to have some of the fruit and not the other. You can't, you can't choose, well, you know, I think I'll have love, but that thing of long-suffering, I don't want any of that. Patience, no, 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 no. Gentleness, forget that. I don't want that. I want love and joy. That's the two I want. And I don't want any of this meekness and long suffering. And, you know, I, I don't want any of that. No, 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 no. You get all of it. If you are filled with the Spirit of Christ, you, you get all of the Spirit of God, which is the fruit of the Spirit. What kind of fruit? comes out of your life if the Holy Spirit is in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, blah, blah, blah. All right, this is what John is saying. John is saying that God the Father, the one who am, said this to me, and the one who has seven spirits inside of him that reveal his complete character, just like Isaiah said he would. This is unbelievable. See, this is some of the symbolics of the book. So how do we know that? Well, the Bible interprets the Bible. There it is in the book of Isaiah. So that's who's talking to him. So we got God the Father talking to him. We got the Holy Spirit talking to him. And then in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. So here we got God saying this. We got the Spirit saying this. And now we got in verse 5, and Jesus Christ. So we got the complete Godhead saying, I'm revealing all of this to you. Uh, notice how he starts describing Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Yeah, he's the firstborn from the dead. He's the one that went and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God. What happened when Jesus resurrected from the dead? He went straight to heaven. You know what would have happened if he didn't go to heaven? We wouldn't go to heaven. What does, that, what does the Bible say about Jesus? He's the firstborn of the dead. What does that mean? It means he's the firstborn of the dead. Do we have any trouble understanding the word firstborn? No, it means he was the first. It means you fit along there somewhere. 
You might be uh, 2,979,000. You may be, you know, uh, 3,450,000. You may, you know, but you have a number somewhere. That's where we get the phrase, your number's up. Now, when your number's up, your number's up. But you are a number somewhere. Well, he was number one. It meant before number one went there, nobody went there. You say, where did the Old Testament saints go? Well, they went to a place, according to uh, the rich man in Lazarus that Jesus told the story, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Like Lazarus saw, the, saw I mean, the, the rich man was in a place that, a, a burning fire and consuming torture, and he looked, and it, and it says, across a great gulf, in other words, a fixture where demons don't come across, by the way. I don't care who tells you. you never, you're never. you not seeing your loved one. I, I mean, I hate to bust that bubble. I, how do I? I done got off into that. I did not do that. I know, I know some of you think, okay, I saw Uncle Henry. No, you didn't. Uncle Henry's in a place, if Uncle Henry's in hell, he's in a place that's separated by a great gulf that he's not going to be able to cross unless you think Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. Jesus said that there's a great gulf fixed between us and them where those that are in there can't cross over to us and we can't cross over to them. Now, you might see a demon imitating Uncle Henry. You know, now you could see that. I'm not saying you didn't see anything. I'm just saying you didn't see Uncle Henry. If Uncle Henry's gone, Uncle Henry's gone. And so but before, before Christ went to heaven, there were two separate places of the departed dead. There was a place called Sheol in the Old Testament. Hades is in the New Testament. Same word, mean, both of them mean the same thing. means the place of the departed dead where they suffer and they torture and they don't like it. And then there's a place called Abraham's bosom, which is what Lazarus was in when the guy saw him, said, I see him in, in Lazarus' bosom. He said, send him so that he can go tell my brothers don't come to this horrible place. And Jesus basically looked at him and said, they have Moses and the prophet, they let them hear them. In other words, I'm not sending somebody back from the dead. I've already sent somebody back from the dead. Jesus came back and said, you need to avoid this place, all right? Hear the word of God. So in a place called paradise, on the thief on the cross, Jesus, on the day he was crucified, the thief said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Today you're going to be with me, not in Hades, not in Sheol, not in Gehenna, not in Keturah, but you shall be with me in, in the word is paradise, which means exactly what it means, paradise. In other words, the place of the departed righteous, the place of the people who love the Lord before Jesus went to heaven and we can actually go to heaven. See, Jesus still walking around on the earth. Jesus hadn't gone back to heaven, sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, and become the first one to go to heaven. He's still in transition. So what about all those people? Well, they're sitting there in holding pattern, in a place of greatness, in a place of paradise, in a place of goodness, in a place of everything, waiting for Jesus to be the first one to go to heaven. And once he did that, then Jesus said, all right, guys, come on, let's go. And if you'll read the book, Gospel of Matthew, you'll find out on the day Jesus resurrected, and I know this sounds weird, but on the day that Jesus resurrected, Old Testament saints were seen walking around in the city of Jerusalem. It was like on his way back from paradise, the place of the departed righteous dead, where they are blessed, they are happy, they are enjoying everything, but they're still not in the presence of God the Father because the first one to go hadn't gone yet. They're just waiting. Well, he comes down. You say, what did Jesus do those three days that he was in the, in, in, in the grave? You know, the Bible says like Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of, in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of earth. What was Jesus down there doing? He was down there cheerleading in paradise, saying, hey, guys, get ready. We're going home. Hey, man, I'm going to tell you, do we just, hey, just a few more hours, brother, we're going home. Isaiah said, you know what I'm going to do, man? I'm going to dance around that throne. David said, you're going to have to beat me to it because, I, man, I just can't wait to get my groove on. He said, it's going to be awesome around that throne. Jeremiah said, it's going to be great. Daniel looked at him and said, would you quit weeping, man? <laughs> Come on. God's going to take us out of that fiery furnace and that pit of line. I mean, glory to God. It's going to be a wonderful thing. And all the saints of God were just cheerleading and jumping up and down and getting ready. And Jesus was saying, come on, boys. It's going. I mean, Jesus was leading a pet rally down in paradise saying, guys, it's ready to go. And then after three days, Jesus said, let's go. And grabbed the keys and said, give me those keys. They belong to me and took them to heaven. And on the transition journey, according to the book of Matthew, it's actually written in the verses, if you read them, 
that the Old Testament saints during the transition period were seen walking around the streets of Jerusalem. Somebody said, my Lord, is that Isaiah? Is that Jeremiah? Man, I don't know who that is. What is that guy with that moth-eating up looking thing? Jeremiah, is that you? you know? and, 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 and so the, in the transition, they were seen walking around the city. And so they were on their way from paradise to heaven because Jesus was going to heaven to sprinkle his blood so he could become number one and then everybody else could go because he was number one. Once number one's there, then everybody else can go in their order. But no, before that, number one's got to know number one. And, and I'm just saying that this is what the book is saying. The book is saying he's the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That he's just describing Jesus to us uh, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. You know what that means? That means I don't need a priest. It means I am a priest. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a priest. I know, hey, I mean, say it with a little conviction, would you? I know they don't look like a priest, but they are a priest. It, mean, it just means, look, I don't need a priest. I know we have religions on this earth who have priests, right? And they say, you must come and confess your sin to the priest, and then the priest is going to take your sin to God. I'm just telling you that that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you are a priest. Now, I know you look at yourself and you say, I'm not much of a priest. Well, I didn't say you were much of a priest. I'm just saying you are one. Because God has made you one. When he washed you with his blood and cleansed you, he filled you with the Holy Spirit of God. You don't need somebody to go stand before God for you. You go stand before God for yourself. We are a kingdom of priests. I don't need a pope. I don't need a pappy. I don't need a priest. I don't need a confessor. I don't need anybody to go between me and God. Jesus is my high priest. And he has made me a priest before God so that I can go for myself. And that deserves an amen. Holy Ghost of God. And, this, and John's just saying, I want you to know that's who sent me this word. That who has been talking to me. And a king's and priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's not finished. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye shall see him. Now let me just say this. and then we. I'm sorry, y'all. We got to quit. But... Um, no, we got through five verses. No, seven. All right. Um, all right, let me just say this to you. There's one distinction that all of us need to make, and you need to know this. In the Bible, there are several mentions of the return of Jesus. And most of us use the same term for the next return of Jesus. If I ask you uh, about, the, about the coming of Christ, we would probably use the word second coming right? All right, we would use that phrase because he came the first time as a baby in a manger to, to, to Bethlehem and so forth. And then the next time he comes, we would generally call it the second coming of Christ. However, that's not what the Bible calls it. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes three comings of Christ and a rapture. And let me, I know, okay, I just blew your mind. You're going, uh-oh, that joker whacked out. All right, let me, just, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you because we're going to need to know this because here it is. This verse right here talks about it, and you're going to be confused if you don't know this. This is talking about he's coming in the clouds, and I know every one of you are thinking about Thessalonians where he says that he's going to come in the clouds, and then, and, then, and then the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, so we're thinking that's what that's talking about. But notice that's not the way it's described. The, the, the coming where Jesus comes into the clouds and he doesn't actually touch the earth. He actually is in the clouds, and he calls us up to the clouds. He doesn't actually put his foot on the earth. He just comes in the clouds. And Matthew says it's like a thief in the night. What does that mean? It means nobody knows he was there until they see what's gone. Just like a thief that breaks into your house at night. The only way you knew he was there is because something's missing. You didn't know it while he was there. 
And Matthew says, if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have protected his house and not allowed his property to be stolen. So the clear word is that when Jesus comes to take us who are alive on this earth and who have died on this earth and whose bodies are everywhere all over the earth, eaten by sharks, burned up by fire, uh, gone back to the dust of the earth, worms eating us, whatever might have happened. You're in some mosque or mausoleum or some container where your body's all shriveled up, but it's still there. Whatever form your body might be in, the chemistry of your body, you are you. And, 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 and when Jesus comes, your body is going to recollect itself from wherever it is and whatever condition it is on the earth. And it's going to recollect itself and it's going to be taken up so that it can be rejoined with your spirit in heaven. Don't ask me why. I don't know why, but there's something evidently unique about you that your body contains and it won't be complete until it's taken and made a new body in heaven. I mean, there's something unique about you that makes you you so that when we walk around in heaven, I can look and I, I, can, I, and I can say, Wesley, is that you? And you say, Pastor, is that you? Man, what an improvement. I mean, you know, and I, I was like, glory to God, that, that's exactly right. So now, now that's the rapture of the church. So when we talk about the rapture of the church, we're talking about a secret coming. Nobody knows it but the people that are raptured. The whole earth is not going to see it. The whole earth is going to wake up the next day and say, what happened to these people that used to live down there? And the Antichrist is going to say, well, the Russians stole them. Or those Martians finally came down here and got all of them. I mean, or whatever kind of crazy delusional thing they're going to say. And according to Thessalonians, God's going to give a spirit of delusion to this earth so that everybody will believe the lie because when they had a chance to believe the truth, they rejected the truth because they love their sin more than they love God. And so whatever the demon Antichrist says happened to all those people that used to live down the street and used to go to that little church down there and they're gone, whatever he says about them, the world is going to believe it because they're delusional. They, they, God, it doesn't say the devil deceived them. It says, and God shall send them strong delusion that they will believe the lie. And so whatever explanation it'll be, everybody will say, okay, well, I guess it finally happened to them. I knew they'd go carry it too far. And they, you know, whatever happened to those crazy loons down there, believe Jesus, blah, 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 blah. All right, that's the rapture. That is the secret coming of the Lord. Nobody will know it but those of us who get taken. So when it talks about the coming of the Lord where everybody, look at what it says. Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, the Jews, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. That's talking about the second coming of Jesus. It's talking about the second time Jesus puts his foot on the earth. The first time he put his foot on the earth was in a manger in Bethlehem. The second time he puts his foot on the earth is going to be on a mountaintop overlooking the valley of Megiddo, which is a real valley in a real place right off the Mount of Olives. He's going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives, by the way, and the Mount of Olives is going to split right down the middle. By the way, the Howard Johnson people uh, uh, wanted to build a Howard Johnson on the mountainside of, uh, of, of, the, of the mountain, and they did some research, and, study, and they found that there's a gigantic fault line running right down the middle of the Mount of Olives, and they were declared the right, they were not given the right to build the Howard Johnsons because it would be built on a fault line. I'm just telling you, when Jesus' feet touches the top of that Mount of Olives, it's going to split right down the middle, right where that fault says it's going to split. Now, that is the second coming of Christ. That is the second time he puts his foot on the ground. And in the book of Revelation, when you read about his coming again, it's talking about that coming. It's not talking about the rapture. The rapture surely is going to happen. We're surely going to be gone. But this is talking about when the whole world sees him set down because he's going to rescue tiny Israel from certain annihilation as all the armies of the earth, and you'll see all of this, it's, you know, it's real clear, are going to move against tiny Israel. And then here comes their rescuer out of heaven, sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, 
And the battle of Armageddon starts, and I just call loosely, I say the battle, because it's not much of a battle. It's just really Jesus saying a couple of words, and everybody dies. That, you know, I mean, it's not much of a fight, is what I'm saying to you, but it is called the battle of Armageddon, and it's at the end of a big, bad tribulation period. And, and, and anyway, you'll see all of the stuff I'm talking about, but point being, that's what this is talking about. One of these days, Israel is going to see who they pierced, who they Now, this is according to Zechariah chapter 13. If you want to take your Bible and read it, Zechariah, little small minor prophet, chapter 13, read what it says there. In that day a fountain shall be opened up for cleansing in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, they're going to look at him. When he hits that mountain, they're going to look at him, and they're going to say, where would you get those wounds? And he's going to say, in the house of my friends. And they're going to fall out in sackcloth and ashes and weep and say, how could we have been so blind? How could we have been so stupid? That's our Messiah. And they're going to recognize him as their Messiah, and they're going to receive him as their king, as their Messiah. Nationally, that is. There are a few Jews now that receive the Lord, but not. But as a nation, as a whole, they reject, still reject Israel. Well, that's what this is talking about. And when they see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. How could we have been so blind? How could we have been so stupid? Why didn't we see him? I am Alpha and Omega. You know, Jesus is called the Word of God, right? Jesus is the Word. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So when he looks at them and he says, I'm the first letter of the alphabet and I'm the last letter of the alphabet and I'm every letter in between. So he's the, he's the complete word of God. That's what he's saying to him. He said, I started all this stuff off. I'll be here at the end of this. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was, who is, uh, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty Amen. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation. I got to stop right there because that's really where I should have started today. All right. Let's start there next week. Y'all okay? 